Good morning, how are y'all? Hello? <laughs> I know it. Won't you stand with us as we begin worship with every day? Maybe everybody else will show up, who knows? with your neighbors and congratulate them for setting their clocks an hour ahead. All right, every day.
você. That song certainly says why we have come here uh, this morning, why we got up, uh, what feels like an hour. We come this day to give you our thanks and our praise. We pray this prayer then today in Jesus' name, remembering how he taught each of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it is good to see each one of you here uh, uh, this morning, and, and, and I really do hope uh, that as, as this service progresses, and this morning, this whole day progresses, that you will feel God's, uh, God's love and power and presence in your midst. Uh, on the back of your bulletin, I've got a few announcements that I want to call attention to, and I know you can read these, but, but I also know that sometimes you either don't read them or, 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 or read them too quickly, so I, I want to remind you of some things. Um, we are going to uh, be sending our bus out to the John Quill Festival at Old Washington this Friday, so if you are interested in that or unable to do that uh, during the day, be sure you let Fran know. I think, I think I hope I'm not telling you wrong, but I think the bus is pretty close to being filled right now. So, so if you want to be part of that, I want, want to invite you. You can see the announcement about the baby shower for Laura Wyatt uh, next Sunday from, from noon till uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, this is going to be in the parlor. Is that right? Is that what we said? Okay, in the parlor. Um, you can see other things. Uh, Fat Tuesday uh, dinner and auction that we had this past week was a, was a wonderful success again. Uh, a lot of people, if you, if you came, you, you saw this place, we had fun, uh, fun time and fun music. Uh, as this says, about $8,700. We're still uh, working to sell 
uh, the painting over there, and when we do, we think it's, uh, we're going to uh, end up finally about uh, $10,000. That's, that's the range we're at, which is similar to where we were uh, last year. So again, uh, good job to everybody who helped out with that. Uh, for my first time, i got to tell you, it was a lot of fun, and, and I enjoyed it greatly. And then I want you to um, look at this, this one that's second from the bottom here, Women of the Bible presentation. Uh, this is one that Patty is going to be helping with. Well, but there is a group of ladies from First Baptist Church in Nashville, Arkansas, who have been uh, giving this presentation for years now. Uh, they began it a number of years ago as, a, as I believe, a one-time presentation. Uh, they were asked to do it again and again, and as word spread, it has now continued through literally almost a dozen years. Uh, they, they're going to be coming here to our church uh, later on uh, in May, and we want to, we want to be uh, ready. This is going to be a community event, an opportunity for us to invite uh, women from across uh, the community and across the, the churches to be here. So Patty would like to meet with anyone um, who might be interested in finding out a little more about this and possibly um, helping out uh, to, to make this a, a event a big thing. You're going to meet in the parlor to, uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, if there are some of you who are coming to the Bible study at 5, you can get out in time for that. But I want to encourage you to come. Uh, by coming, you're not necessarily signing up for anything yet. You're just hearing about it, and then you can decide from there uh, where, where we should go. Patty, did I get it? All right, all right, man. Go home after, after church today then, so that's good. Are there any other announcements that should come before us? I want to invite some to come up then as we present to God his tithes and our offerings. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give back to you just a portion of what you've given to us. Receive this offering from our hands and use it for the work of your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
So teach my soul to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you They're going out for a, a test, kind of. And in this play that he's taken them to, it's called Caesarea Philippi. And it's a real pagan area. And I know that's a weird word that we don't use very much anymore. But um, it's a place where people a long time ago worshipped a lot of other gods besides the one that we worship. And it looks something like this. <laughs> and you see this big cave right here? Well, up until about 100 years ago, water that you see right here flowed right out of the mouth of that cave. And the people were silly enough to think that there was a God down in that hole and that if they brought enough offerings up to this place, that that God would bless them. And then in places like this, see this hole in the wall right here? Or maybe right here or here? They had all these little stone statues of all these silly little gods that they believed could do things for them. But we don't do that anymore. We just take all of our money and throw it at the mall or at different places like that, huh, where, where we put things over in front of God. But we kind of still have places like that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> this was a real pagan place, and all these gods were surrounding this area. And when Jesus took them, there he asked Peter he said who do people say that I am and Peter was one of those you have those kids in your classroom and they're always saying I know I know pick me pick me well that's kind of the way Peter was and a lot of times he got the answers wrong but he always wanted to answer the question but Jesus said who do people say that I am and they answered him the disciples answered him and they said well some say you're John the Baptist and some say that you're Elijah the prophet and he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter got it right this time. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So think about that for a second. All these places that they're looking, they're surrounded by all these statues of stone. And I would have brought a picture, but it sounds kind of creepy. So I don't know what you said. But all these statues of stone and and they're just things that, that God created, really. But they, don't, they can't do anything for us, not like our God can do. So Peter got it right. 
this time. He knew who Jesus was. He was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But we know who the real one is, don't we? We do. Weeping? I don't know. Poseidon. Poseidon, yeah, yeah, Poseidon. So as soon as they left here, they started heading heading back toward Jerusalem. And um, so it was really important. This was almost kind of like graduation for them because um, they had been with Jesus for a long time. But this was getting to near the end of Jesus' life and his ministry, and he needed to make sure that they knew who he was. And so when Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, then they knew that he knew that they were ready, that they knew who he was. So let's bow our heads and have prayer, okay? Father God, we thank you that you are the living God and that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to live and to die for us. And we thank you, Father, that we can know him personally and have intimate relationship with him. Father, I just claim these little ones for your kingdom. I pray that they will know you fully and intimately, and their lives will be lived in service to you. For it's in Jesus' name that I ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Donna. For the past couple of months, as Donna pointed out, we have been looking at and studying the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and I've, I've tried to be very intentional about the passages that I'm, I'm choosing for us to look at. There's not enough time uh, in, in this series for us to look at everything that we could. So I've tried, to, I've tried to, to pick on two kinds of passages only. One are passages that tell us something about Jesus himself. When we read and study those passages, we are going to get to know Jesus a little better. We're going to learn something about his nature, his character, uh, his, his, his ministry or person. But the other set of, of uh, passages I want to look at are passages that will help us see how the disciples began to get to know Jesus a little better. Today, it's that second set of passages that I want to focus on. And, and I, I want us to really look at, at a series of interactions that Jesus had with Peter. We're, we're literally going to look at one week in the life of Peter. And as we do, I want you to see, I want you to see what had to happen for Peter to get to know Jesus better. My hope, and by the way, you might start curling your toes now because I probably will step on a few today. My hope is that each one of us are going in this beginning of the Lenten season to, to, to figure out how we can get to know Jesus better, the path we need to take, the steps we need to follow. It begins with a passage we've already looked at once before, a passage that Donna was focusing on. Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. gospel, but, but this is one of those times when I, I, I want to share with you how Matthew puts it, because Matthew adds some really important uh, verses to this and some important information that's going to move us on so that we can this time, in, in this sermon, hear the rest of the story. So Matthew put it like this, when, when Peter answered, you are the Christ, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but my, by my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now you have to admit, that'd be enough to turn anyone's head. I mean, that's, that's an amazing amount of authority. Can, can, you, can, you, can you imagine with me now how far Peter has come to get to this point? Go when we first met him, he was just a fisherman. Now he's the de facto leader of this band of disciples, clearly one of Jesus' favorites. When we first meet Peter, he literally is Peter the fisherman. Now, he's Peter the rock, holder of the very keys to the kingdom itself. That's got to make anyone feel good about themselves. I I'm certain that his heart began to swell with pride. And that's when the problems begin. This morning, it's the rest of the story that really intrigues me the most. So let's look. Verse 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. that Jesus has begun to talk about his impending death. Up to this point, he's been doing miracles, he's been telling stories, teaching people with great wisdom and authority. He's, he's been doing all these things, the crowds have been gathering, everything is on a positive and high note. This is the first time that, that Jesus changes the tone. The first time he reveals that He's not going to Caesarea Philippi. He's going to Jerusalem. And that he knows that when he gets there, there's going to be a confrontation. A confrontation that will not end well for him. He's warning them as plainly as he can that he's going to suffer. That he's going to die. That he'll rise up again in three days. None of that made sense. In fact, it's pretty obvious that to Peter, that was simply appalling. That, that something was wrong. Maybe, maybe Jesus didn't know what he was saying. Maybe Jesus didn't understand how his words would sound to other people. Clearly, clearly though, a course correction was needed. Clearly, Jesus needed to be set on a better path. Clearly, somebody had to tell him the truth, had to tell it to him clearly. And so Peter, proud, bold Peter, Peter, the star student of Jesus, Peter, the rock, the holder of the keys of the kingdom, Peter would do what needed to happen. It was clear that he was chosen by Jesus to be the leader of the disciples. Jesus would listen to sage advice from him. So that's why when, when Jesus began to tell everyone what was about to happen, when Jesus began to warn them of where this path would lead and how difficult it would be, Peter stepped up and said, never. He rebuked Jesus, never. This will never happen to you. My guess is Peter thought he was doing something good. My guess is Peter thought 
He was doing what needed to happen. Somebody needed to tell Jesus that he needed another direction. And obviously, who better than him? I'm pretty sure he wasn't expecting the response. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Get behind me, Satan. Satan. How, how could that be? What was Jesus saying? Satan was the adversary. Satan was the name for, for the arch rival of God. Satan. Not Peter. Why, literally, only moments earlier, only moments earlier, Jesus had commended Peter for his tremendous insights and had rewarded him with even greater authority and power. And now he was saying that Peter was being used as a tool of Satan? How in the world could this be? To understand it, I want to take you back a few months. I want to take you back to my first sermon in this series. I want to take you back to the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. I want to take you back to a period of time in a wilderness when the real Satan had tempted Jesus. The real Satan, during that 40-day period in the wilderness, had tempted, had tempted Jesus to turn away from his chosen path to choose the easy way out, to choose sensationalism, to use his power for his own gain and his own good. Satan had lost that round, but it told even back then that he wasn't through. Satan's never through. He was going to come back, and he was going to find another way to get at Jesus. If a frontal assault wasn't going to work, let's try one of the disciples. Peter. Peter, look at him. His pride has replaced his humility. And when that happens, Satan was saying, you're mine. Peter now went in front of Jesus and tempted him with exactly the same things that Satan had tempted him with in the wilderness. To choose the easy way, to follow his own path, to listen to the voice of men, not God. And once again, once again, that blinding anger of Jesus' fury just blazed forth. It, it focused this time directly on Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. For you are not thinking about the things of God. You're thinking about the things of men. I want you to make no mistake about that. I, I want this to be clear. Peter the rock was literally being crushed. By Jesus. Peter the rock was clearly being put in his place. When Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, I think he was in essence saying, Peter, you do not know me as well as you think you do. You do not know the will of God as well as you think you do. Peter, your place is behind me. Not 
Peter, you are not the teacher. You are the student. Peter, your role is not to tell me what to do, not to tell me where to go, but to follow behind me and go where I tell you to go. Get behind me, Peter. What a devastating blow that must have been to him. And yet, it wasn't just to him. Peter, or Jesus, so caught up in this, he, he saw Peter, he saw the problem, and, and, and so all of a sudden he gathered everybody. In verse 34, he gathered the crowd around him along with his disciples, and he kept on with this. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up a me. Peter, this isn't just about you. It's about everybody. It's about anyone who'd follow. Get behind me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus is saying his wrath was still burning. I can, I can feel it. He was saying to everybody, he was saying to Peter, Peter, if you're ashamed of me, if you don't like the way I'm going, watch out. If your pride is going to get in the way of humility, if you're going to try to tell me what to do, watch out, Peter. For you're going to be a tool of Satan. Would that we could just wash over this. Just say, well, Peter sure had a lot to learn. It'd be so easy to say, wow, Peter, you just... You just said that, that Jesus was the Christ. How'd you get it so wrong, the next step? How, how'd you get it so wrong? That's what pride does. And I want to tell you, it's still a problem today. Would that we Christians, we the church, had learned the lessons long ago, but we haven't. This kind of scenario, this scene has played itself out time and time and time again through the centuries, through all these years. It's playing itself out in churches everywhere. It can play itself out without us being aware right here in this congregation. It goes on time and time again. Christians, we fool ourselves into thinking that simply because we come to church and, and read our Bibles, that we know God better than we really do. We Christians, we let our pride get in the way of humility. We won't say it, but we start putting our own hopes, our own dreams, our own agendas in front of God's. Our committee meetings, our, our, our joint gatherings become more important than our prayer meetings. Our own plans, our own ideas, they become more important than listening for what God wants us to do. Without ever meaning, without knowing it, we begin to substitute our own ideas, our own plans, our own directions for God's because we've forgotten to listen for His voice. We've become so certain that the church is about us that we forgot it's about God. If we're not careful, we start acting like we're the teacher, like we're the master, like we're the ones in charge. Now let's be careful. Let's be careful. Peter had to be broken. Peter had to endure a stern rebuke. Peter had to be put in his proper place before he'd ever be able to move forward. Pride clouded his eyes. He was saying the right words, you're the Christ. But pride put him in a wrong place. He was doing now the wrong things. 
Get behind me, Peter. Get behind me, church. Pastor, get behind me. For that is the only proper place for you. It's a hard lesson. It's hard to acknowledge that that might actually be happening to us. Peter could have been left alone. That could have been the end of the story. But in fact, it's not. All of that, I believe, is leading up to a grand story. Peter could have been left to, to pick up the pieces, to pick up the pieces of his pride, to pick up the pieces of his, of his ministry, of, of, of all this, and, and to do it by himself. But that's not the way of Jesus. And, and the good news is, Jesus' rebukes, they're always meant to guide us. They're, they're always in the end meant to strengthen us and to move us forward. And so it was for Peter. Six days went by. A week now after this event, a chastened and humbled Peter was now about to see Jesus in all his glory. An humbled Peter, eyes wide open, were now, was now about to see what he had only proclaimed with his lips to be true earlier. Chapter 9, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It's amazing. The same disciple who just a week earlier had boldly proclaimed, You are the Christ had boldly said, I know who you are. Now in the presence of the glory of Christ himself, didn't know what to say. He, he's practically speechless. Just a week before, Peter had been content to listen to his voice, little realizing that it was speaking the words of Satan. Now he was realizing it was time to listen to Jesus' voice. And when he did, he'd be hearing the voice and the words of God. A week earlier, Jesus, or Peter, had thought he knew Jesus. But he'd been humbled. His eyes had been opened. And only now, was he truly ready to see Jesus in all his glory? A week earlier, Peter had dared tell Jesus what to do, where to go, how to move forward. But now, now he realized that his place was behind Jesus. And he was going to be content to listen and to follow. It's quite a journey that he had that week. Quite a path. And for him, at least, every step was necessary for that humility to take, the humility that would finally allow him to see Christ. There's a lot... 
in this, in this, in this opening Sunday of the Lenten season, the, 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 there's a lot that I'm going to want you to ponder this week. Good people, don't let your pride replace humility. And church, don't get in front of Jesus. No matter how good we think we are, no matter how dedicated we are to the church, to, 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 to Christ, all that, we do not know Jesus as well as we think we do. We do not know him fully, not by ourselves, not unless he reveals himself completely to us. God is so big. Jesus is so great. Be careful. Unless you and I allow a small vision of Jesus to fill our focus. Be careful. Remember, good people, we are always, always the students sitting at the feet of the good teacher. place will always be to be servants following the master. Our proper role will always be to listen through prayer, through discernment, to listen for the Spirit to reveal to us the voice of God and then to follow. Don't get ahead of Jesus. Don't let pride take over. May you have the ears to hear, the eyes to see, the heart to feel, the faith to accept the truth of God's word this day. Lord, open our hearts. We want to see you as you really are, not as we portray you. Forgive us when we get ahead of you. Presume to know the way forward for our lives, for our family, for our church. For God, help us, humble us, that we may truly listen to you that our hard desire will be to follow you alone. For then, God, we know we will see you more clearly. Help us in this season. Amen. Would you stand with us as we be, uh, in this worship service with uh, Let God Arise. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love, our God. He's the God who saves. Our God is the God who saves. Let God let God arise, our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and forever. And His enemies will run for sure, and the church will stand, she will in he holds the keys of life, our Lord. Death has no sting, no final word. Our God is the God who saves. Our God is the God who 
take the blinders off, when we open our hearts and our minds, when we, when we replace our pride with humility, when we dare to stand behind Jesus and follow, our God will arise. We will see him more clearly. We will know that joy and that peace will flood our souls, and we will be moving in the direction God wants us to go. So let's go from this place today. Let's go renewed, refreshed, determined to follow Jesus always and to listen to his voice. Go in peace. Amen. And let God arise.